All right, everybody, welcome back to Matt Money. And as you've already seen on the thumbnail, it's going to be another Palantir video. It's going to zero. Rocket Lab's going to zero. Oil's going to zero. The S&P 500's going to zero. And according to some people, Google is also going to zero. But what I wanted to highlight today specifically is I still think a lot of people are somewhat curious as to what Palantir does. And some people are not really understanding it. Uh, and I wrote a thread on Twitter that's done relatively well. And I won't say by any means that it's a really good um, in-depth view as to what's going on at Palantir and what you're learning at Palantir or what they're doing. But I think it gives a good overview. So if this is your first time really looking at the company, um, first and foremost, I'd say 90% of you shouldn't look at the company. 90% of you should probably just invest your money in the S&P 500. But if you're a gambling degenerate like myself and have a lot of conviction and a little bit of playing around money, uh, that leaves probably 10% of you. Feel free to listen on. And uh, for the other 90%, just sit here, poke, and laugh in the comments section about how stupid all of us are. But uh, so without further ado, let's actually just hop in to the, um, into the screen, look at Twitter, pull it up. And we'll talk about some of the comments as well. So um, I'd say this is probably the better of the uh, tweets that I've ever done. But basically, Palantir will demonstrate a drastic shift in how companies will operate going forward. Software for the modern enterprise, if you will. And that's kind of like a playoff of what Alex Carboy says. And yes, the company's been in business for 20 years. A lot of people already know that. But really, it's only been focused on the commercial aspect of things and focusing it away from, say, government only to now being specifically for providing government services and services for making sure that the West continues to survive and thrive and win uh, and save Rome, if that makes sense. But also coupling that with five, six, seven years ago, really going after the commercial space with deals like with you've seen with BP, Airbus, and a few others that you might have seen at FoundryCon. So starting off with Project Gotham, which was really their first product, it's the eldest of the modern products for Palantir, uh, created for government, uh, and is really is their operating system for decision making. And it's an environment that you live in day to day to kind of help drive decisions. And the cool thing is, is even though this was made, you know, however many years ago, it kind of releases what they think their total addressable market is. And it's, you know, not really given any sort of magnitude. It's kind of just showing, you know, in a relative scale in comparison to each other. But you can see each year they come out with additional pieces or industries in which they kind of tackle to help with whatever Gotham or in the cases you'll see with Foundry and stuff of the like really attack. And you can see they added, you know, all sources within intelligence community, defense, they uh, added in, uh, operations, which is intelligence and operations, AI-enabled mission commands. So things like that, Edge AI, Meta Constellation, Titan, these things that help with respect to low power or low access to internet sort of opportunities, which are still going to be able to connect up to Gotham and provide that decision-making capability on the go. So I think that that is truly where Palantir kind of started from, which is keeping the West safe and making sure the West is security. And this is stuff that you've seen them kind of interact with, preventing terrorist attacks and things of the like, and also probably helped with what was going on when they helped leave Afghanistan, potentially what they're utilizing now the days uh, in the Ukraine with some of those uh, capabilities that Gotham provides. The Neo Foundry, it's a program that I use specifically every day. It's something that you literally just log on to a Google Chrome. You log into an instance. And with that, as I wish I could show you, but you could look it up on the internet, Palantir's website basically provides you the opportunity to filter, um, uh, manipulate data in any sort of way, shape, or form. Um, great applications that I've used on it, Quiver, Fusion, and a few other uh, custom applications that our company has used. And I started using this product back in 2017 timeframe when they really launched it. And at the time there was like very few actual products within it. They had just really started Quiver. They just started a few other things. And I wasn't sure if that was because they were onloading them 
onto our instances and our ability to use those things or if they legit were just creating them on the fly. I mean, we're literally talking about when Foundry was released, my company was up and I think that they were kind of creating the product as we were sitting there. And um, it was pretty interesting to see because over time we've now built in our organization, you know, 15 to 20 custom applications. And so I feel like you have a spot where you have specific Foundry like uh, applications which is like Fusion, Quiver, stuff of the like that I kind of mentioned, uh, reports, you know, things like that, where you kind of can like create a, a PowerPoint-like structure, but at the same time it has constantly updating things. So you can write like, here is the current production for, or here's the current flow of this factory or this particular reservoir uh, or this particular driving operator or something of the like and it updates in real time as opposed to having to go to power bi hit refresh 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 or something of the like you can kind of set it up where it's like hey i'm gonna wake up this morning look at the report i don't need to hit refresh or anything of the like it's down up to the last few minutes but sometimes in the case it's up to the last few seconds uh and this is the way life is and some people, you know, if you're talking about business managers or something the like, might only look at that. Whereas somebody like myself is a little bit more in the trenches, looking at individual well files, looking at individual factories, looking at individual pipelines, looking at individual, you know, product lines or something of the like. And this also is something that has been built uh, to kind of withstand multiple different things, right? They added, you know, the platform itself, the analytics piece. Um, the machine learning modeling piece, the digital twin piece, um, as you can kind of see, the EdStream pipeline builder, uh, Ops PI, all those things that really that really add to the features of Foundry. And I'm sure they'll continue to add things in 2023 and beyond. And the thing that was really cool is that they also launched Apollo in 2020. And this one's a little bit more interesting because it's not as like, say, a tangible piece, uh, but it's really cool, specifically people that are in very high stakes sort of delivery areas like the government where they need no downtime or say you're in a business where downtime equals thousands of dollars. So you work in a factory floor, you work in an oil and gas company where if you shut down, you're talking about thousands, if not millions of dollars of revenue in a day being lost. And so Apollo is a software as a service operating system that allows deployment of Foundry, Gotham uh, applications to the environment where necessary, no interruptions, downtime, or anything necessary. So they kind of brought uh, Palantir software as a service to any sort of environment in 2020. And now they're really starting to understand and, and be able to, to, to deliver that out to the edge with very little, if no downtime. And that is huge as for the reasons I already mentioned with respect to, you know, time is money, right? And so any shut in um, or downtime associated with that not only causes headaches, but inefficiencies and also the fact that those assets are not in working condition. And you have AIP, which is their AI platform uh, to be deployed in the coming month is what uh, Carpus kind of said. And it's supposed to combine the company's proprietary, proprietary data located in Foundry, Gotham, and really allow you to collaborate and integrate that with public data. Now, this means that your data in your particular on-premise cloud or in AWS or Google Cloud or Azure can be strictly you know, private to you and to your users and have that security associated with things uh, and then also collaborate with the public databases that allow you to create things like forecasting weather and how that's going to impact your sort of private industry or what have you. And it gives you a user interface to use where you can collect items from Foundry, Gotham, and use your existing ontology and level uh, multi-level uh, models and stuff like that, language models. And... Uh, sorry, I was getting machine learning and language models mixed up and really try to understand in a simple form, you know, how things are going to be used. And what's beneficial about that is sometimes Palantir can be, I don't want to say not user friendly, but 
it is something that's a little bit intense. It's like relearning Microsoft Word. It's like relearning computers, uh, relearning an operating system on your phone. It's like going from Apple to Android. It's not immediately going to be something that you can pick up and within you know, 10 minutes be able to understand. It's going to take days, if not weeks, to fully understand where you need to go, when, how to find data. And it's not really that difficult. It can be really intuitive to an extent, but there's a lot of capabilities, a lot of power, right? And so with that, each one of those little modules and applications needs a little bit of time to be able to get used to. And so something like AIP allows you to go to one particular page, one user interface, instead of having to use user interfaces on multiple applications and really find out what you're looking for. So all of these things are standalone products, but each of them has their ability to play well with each other or be standalone. And the company has reinvented itself, which I like to think of back in 2003 when they started, 2013 when they really started to kick off Project Gotham, 2017, 2020, 2023. And each year, each of those products, as we kind of showed in the picture above, has added more capability to each operating system. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight specifically in this is I hear a lot of people talking about how slow and long Palantir is taking to acquire new customers and sell the products, even to the extent where some people say the products are crap because if they were so great, they'd sell themselves. And I'm personally in the belief that this is all in the plan and you have to take an unconventional or different path to see those unconventional or different outcomes, right? They're focused on the purpose of the organization, which is saving the West, which is trying to make sure that Rome isn't lost and we lose America and its whole and we tr truly try to establish ourselves. I'm a firm believer that a lot of this software in Ukraine for the vaccine rollout uh, and many other places have been given away for free because the long-term benefit of these, this product being given away for free is more aerial extent and more people becoming reliant on the product and seeing how great the product truly is. And I truly believe that we're just in the early beginning of the stages of this. And so you're probably sitting there like, Matt, you're talking a lot, but you're really not saying all too much, right? You're talking about release dates and everything the like, but why does this all matter? And I want to talk about specifically um, AWS and how slowly it started. Everyone knows how great of a product AWS has been, but you'll probably be around in the early 2000s or maybe some of you guys that have been investing now for 20 years or so. And remember, everyone is really scratching their head when Palantir, sorry, when Amazon really started to uh, look at AWS. So like you're an e-commerce platform, you sell books, or you're just getting started and selling other small materials and items. What the hell do you guys know about AWS? And they were focused on customer support and customer service and making sure that things get done quickly. AWS kind of fits into their model um, if you look at it from an Amazon perspective. And so it fits into their culture quite well. But what I want to highlight specifically, and I'll highlight this picture really quick, is that it took Amazon from 2006 until about 2011, 2012, so six years before they really hit a 1 billion annual run rate um, to the point where now they're making $80 billion a year. Keep in mind, this is a little bit old. They hit 71 billion last year, uh, but they're on track in the trailing 12 months to kind of hit 80 billion in the 2023 range. So you probably sit there and be like, that's a lot, right? But look how vastly fast this happened once you had the penetration, once people understood the tools, once people realized that AWS is superior comparatively, comparatively to the other competitors that are out there, uh, they truly started to gain ground. And I had some conversations with Sachin on Palantir Weekly. He said, well, AWS kind of created the industry for cloud and, and stuff of the like. And to be very fair, um, I would agree. Right? I mean, I wasn't really that old and that much of knowledge of it, but I'd say that Palantir is also the one that's kind of creating the industry here as well. The industry, digital transformation, as well as the analytics space, machine learning, AI learning, and being able to manipulate data, as well as some of these things have been able to do, other than what we've seen with, say, like robotics and voice learning and stuff like that, which is also artificial intelligence, is really in its infancy. It's something that's going to grow depending on what specific sector you're looking in within these numbers, like AI or whether you're looking at data analytics or digital transformation are going to be growing at a compound annual growth rate between 20 to 40%. And so to me, you know, this is something where you start to look and you're saying, 
Palantir is kind of in its infancy, six, seven years in, in terms of focusing on U.S. commercial. And what I'll get to is maybe just take a step back and, and talk a little bit about that. And maybe I'll circle back as to what I was kind of going down as a rabbit hole. Foundry's been Palantir's biggest success story. Uh, launched in 2017, customer count has continued to explode since. And from 2Q of 2021 to 1Q of 2023, Total commercial customer count has grown from 79 to 280, which is a 250% increase. And so just zooming out a little bit, you can see the trailing 12 months ended 79 customers in 2Q of 2021. And now they just report to 280. And it goes back to, you know, talking about how really, you know, you think about they only had 78 commercial customers that's not just U.S. commercial customers. That's commercial customers in total, you know, just two years ago. And now they're up to 280. And you have to remember how Palantir works, right? They work in the acquire, expand, and scale phase, where majority of the time in the acquire phase, they're doing things for free or at a revenue negative rate to be able to establish customers and get them on and really try to understand their problems to see if it's going to be a worthwhile partnership. And once they do realize that, they continue to expand. And, and that's where I'm going to get to with respect to this next tweet here that I have. In the past three years, average top 20 customer revenue has gone from, which a lot of people say, oh, you know, net retention is not that great. Dollar net retention is not that great. Pound tier to zero. If you think of the top 20 customer revenue, it's gone from 27 million to 51 million, which is an 89% increase. That's pretty significant. And you couple that with the 250% customer count increase you start to realize that things are just kind of beginning, right? You had a 34% increase from first quarter of 2020 to the first quarter of 2021. And then from March of 2022 to, uh, oh, that's a previous slide. And then from 1Q of 2022 to 1Q of 2023, you had another 14% increase. So in overall, um, pretty significant in terms of average revenue per customer. Um, over the past several years. Um, so I think that, you know, a lot of people aren't necessarily thinking wholly with what's kind of going on here. Uh, going from 27 million to 51 million is a pretty big deal, um, especially if you're continuing to acquire customers at a pretty significant pace. Now, that being said, uh, what I want to get back to is kind of what I was highlighting with the AWS piece which is the United States commercial business, which was really just getting started in 2017 timeframe, which is when my company started using it and several others. Foundry just hit $1 billion in annual run rate in, in six years, going from 2017 to 2023. So think about this whole thread and ask yourself if it sounds familiar. AWS also took five to six years to hit the 1 billion annual run rate. So my question is, is Foundry done or is it just began? And my opinion is that it has just begun and they just released their Amazon Alexa, which is AIP. Another thought, if any of you guys have worked in any companies like myself uh, these days and realized how inefficient data and processes can be and are being taken care of in our organizations, these are multi-billion dollar organizations that use tabular data entry like SAP, Excel to run their businesses, which let's be honest, 30 years ago, it was revolutionary, but it's 2023. And modern operating systems used to manipulate and split data using OS and ease of decision making overcome the Windows OS operating systems and releases of the 1990s. And this is a step change in capability that we're kind of seeing from Foundry to Windows being comparable to what AWS was to the internet just, uh, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And so my, my thought and, and hope to you guys is that the rumblings that you've heard about Palantir being reminiscent of the rumblings of the 1990s about Microsoft, 2000, about Amazons and Apples, and the 2010s about Netflix and Tesla. And so my thought process is these are rumblings that, you know, sometimes they fizzle out, but I'm a firm believer that these are real and Palantir is here to stay. It has the culture, it has the capability, it has the mindset to be did the next day AWS. Anybody that talks to these folks that recognizes that they're different, um, you know, one quick, quick note I'll have to say is I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with Simon Sinek and he talks a little bit about, you know, 
the the folks that uh, when in the early 2008 time frame uh, or early 2000s time frame when the iPod had just come out and he went to go talk to Microsoft at uh, at a at a summit or something of the like and all that Microsoft was talking about was how they can beat Apple and create something and they had Zoom and he gave him the Zoom the Zoom was awesome right but he went to go speak to some Apple folks and had to share a cab with one of the local um, local executives. And it turned out to be like one of the few first executives within Apple. And he said, you know, Microsoft, they have a really good product. And all they're talking about is, is how great it is. And it's one of the better things. It's actually better than your iPod Touch. And the Apple executive just looks at him and says, that's awesome. That's great. Because all Apple really cared about was creating tools and creating products that could help people teach better and basically get their job done, whether I was from production, whether that was from creating music, whether that was creating movies and cinematic adventures. That's what they cared about. They didn't care about being the best company in the world. They didn't care about making the most money. They cared about just creating efficiencies and creating the best tools and creating the best products so that people could live and have fun and be able to deliver what they need to deliver. So to me, that's reminiscent of what Palantir wants. I don't necessarily care about the quarter to quarter growth. They don't necessarily care about, you know, getting as many customers through the door, selling as many things. They would rather give the product away and sell, help solve problems rather than actually get money through the door. But anyway, I digress and I head back to the, the, the tweets that I have here. The company is the ear to the street. They don't sell application software. They sell solutions. And so once you realize that, it will take your mind off of buffing up a sales team or products sucks um, to realizing that, hey, Palantir is a little bit different. And how much runway is there actually in these total addressable markets that they're going after? And so uh, it was a 2 a.m. ramble, so it wasn't the best and most eloquently worded, uh, but I tagged a few people and we had some good responses. And I encourage you guys to, to go read it yourselves and listen to some of the responses. Um, but I had a few other people and it, you know, reach out and, and kind of talk to me and, and touch base. And some of it found it really great. Some of it, you know, was thinking, Hey, you know, this is too much rah, rah for Palantir. Uh, I had some folks from, you know, that use snowflake, you know, reach out and say, you know, basically trying to iterate that snowflake is, is just in the same competition. Then I had another guy, you know, reach out to me and it got me really thinking like, it, it, you know, I, I sometimes I say things on Twitter and I'm being brutally honest. And I think sometimes people think I'm being facetious. And I actually was starting to think, I was just like, well, you know, Palantir is such a great track record, right? Helped find Osama bin Laden, has helped save multiple terrorist attacks over the past, you know, 10, 15 years in Europe, helped with the, um, the executing of the leave in Afghanistan, Ukraine, the CDC. Uh, vaccine rollout uh, globally, not just not just in the U.S., but globally, Ukraine and many other um, multiple charitable sort of use cases that have been given away for free. I think uh, I forget what exactly it was, but Carp was just at their speaking at their summit, you know, within the last two weeks, and he was talking about how he provided the data and the use for them for free, which I anticipate, you know, if the cause is good enough and people start to catch on like they do at Foundry Cons and the like, it'll just help the cause for more and more people realizing that Foundry and Gotham can be the backbones of their organization and make things so much more efficient and quick uh, comparatively to how they're doing things now, which is through Microsoft Excel cell spreadsheets and PowerPoints. And so it gets people to sort of think a little bit. But I had some folks reach out and another, you know, few folks and I, it just goes to show you, you know, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody or devalue a lot of what these comments said. I did actually learn something new today, which is that, you know, Palantir has the ability to connect up to Snowflake. Snowflake is a data lake and, and many other things like machine learning capabilities and analytics and engineering built into it as well. So I will shout out that individual, but I think there's a lot of misconception about some of these companies because they are so advanced and, you know, one of the things that I kind of realized is why is Palantir such a first mover in some of these things? And I think, you know, rightly or wrongly, I think it's because 
they care about the purpose one, which isn't the rightly or wrongly part, but the rightly or wrongly part might be is that they're giving it away for free and they're willing to lose money in the short term to be able to help solve solutions, not just for the company, but for the world's problems to keep the West as great as they can be. And to make sure that in this world that we live in, the divisive world that we live in, the West continues to thrive and continues to do well. As globalization ends, we need to be stronger and connected more than ever. And with that, Palantir is right there to help in any way, shape, or form. And so my hope is that you know you guys literally sit, listen, maybe look at some of these tweets as poorly written as they may be, or just my thoughts on this particular video and truly start to understand that this isn't a company that's trying to make you money in 2024 or 2025. Uh, this is a company that is trying to literally reshape every modern enterprise today. And that's not going to be something that's done overnight. You, know, you have to think of how Microsoft built, got built and how Apple got built and how long it took those items to truly become behemoths and things of true technological change in the way that we do life and business. Amazon wasn't built in a day. Google was not built in a day. Microsoft was not built in a day. And really, Palantir's as much as you like to think about it, you know, they might say 20 years old, but it's really a five, six year old company just based off of truly changing and recognizing that the technology was there to, to pivot and really get us to a place where they said, you know what, this can be used for U.S. commercial. This could be used for, you know, global use rather than specifically finding terrorists or hunting terrorists. And so I went off on a little bit of tangent and I hope that you guys enjoyed the, the Twitter feed. Um, and I hope you guys just enjoyed this video overall. So I appreciate it and uh, I'll see you guys on the next video.